greeting all the people who are watching the live stream today. Um, today I'm going to do something that I usually don't or that I usually can. I'm going to read from my notes. Let's hope that that works out well. Um, I must warn you, uh, this um, project I'm going to present you in the next 15 minutes is um, a new project, fresh project, a project that hasn't started yet. We're going to start in January next year. So I can only present you our ideas and the concepts we have for this project. I have no final answers for you yet. I hope that I'm going to have them in three years, present them again. So please just see that as a kind of inspiration or um, an idea with which we can talk about and discuss later. So let's start. What I'm going to talk about in the next hopefully 15 and not 20 minutes is um, let's have a quick view on why we're actually investing quite a lot of money in researching on inclusion in museums. After that, I will talk about why exactly we chose to focus on people with visual impairment and um, why these visitors should be interested in app games at all. And then finally, we're going to take a look at inclusive gaming and how we are planning to create such an inclusive game at our museum in Germany. There we go. So I'm going to introduce myself and my museum for a second. Um, so my name is Anna Ritus. I'm originally from uh, Wien, Vienna, Austria. Um, I've studied prehistory and historical archaeology in Vienna, then went to Leiden here in the Netherlands and studied archaeology with a focus on uh, museum studies. And since three years by now, I work at the Neanderthal Museum. That's a museum on the Neanderthal in Western Germany. And we are about two and a half hours from here. So uh, let's come to a first why question. Why inclusion in the museum? Why do we need to spend thought and money on that? Uh, there are a few good and a few, well, not so good reasons for that. Um, one of the maybe better reasons is, well, it's morally right. It's the right thing to do. Since museums are, a, are institutions financed by society, so naturally the stuff we do with the money we get should be open and accessible to everyone and this also includes people with disabilities naturally one of the not so good reasons is museum council told us so one of the set goals of the museum council is inclusion um, another reason is that in europe germany and the united nations there's a rising number of laws uh, which demand at least accessible if not inclusive access to public institutions. Most museums are public institutions. Some are somewhat in the middle, but still you should orientate yourself on these laws. And maybe the best reason, at least for me, is aside from all these other reasons, um, we should start thinking about inclusion at the institution because um, we are living in a society with ever rising life expectancy. And I think about that. With that, it also means that we have a rising number of people which are elderly, which have walking disabilities, bad eyesight, bad hearing, and so on. So this means in the near future, we museums simply will have to be inclusive because our visitors will become so increasingly diverse. So let's take a, sh we've got a really, really short look at how we've handled the topic of inclusion in the past or how we've treated people with disabilities in the past or not. There we go. Uh, we didn't do so well, really. So inclusion is a really new topic for museums. This has to do with the way we conceptualized um, disability in the past. I'm going to do that really, really quick. Unfortunately, I can't say much about prehistory and people with disabilities. If you have anything to read about that, please tell me. I love reading about that. So uh, just as a quick input, in the Middle Ages, for example, um, Disability was conceptualized as something made by the devil or by fairies or something otherworldly. So it was unnatural. And you were either so lucky as to have the Christian church to, well, look after you because that secured the person who helped you a better afterlife. Or, um, well, they thought you were conjured up by the devil and basically treated you bad or killed you. Um, that didn't really get much better. In the following centuries, since with uh, the Enlightenment, we suddenly had a concept of normal behavior, normal looks, normality. And with that, people with disabilities were unnormal. 
and had to be kept away from normal society. And this brought along the asylums like Bedlam, for example, in Great Britain, or the Narrenturm in Vienna, where people were really just locked away and treated quite badly. So fortunately, in the last 150 to 100 years, there have been several changes in how we see, conceptualize, and treat people with disabilities. We know by now that the disability is not the person. A blind is not simply her or his blindness, but a person with many abilities, wishes, and demands who happens to be unable to see. By the way. That also means that we should not only create helpful tools for people with disabilities, but to learn from the specialness and create new ideas for everyone with them, but more about that later. Um, I'm going to skip the picture on the very right. You can ask me about it later. That's quite an interesting project. So um, another why question, why do we focus on people with visual impairment at all? The problem with creating inclusive museum exhibitions is that exhibitions per se are not inclusive. Why? The basic concept behind an exhibition is that of the exhibit, a symbol for a story, a fact, or basically knowledge. Meaning by exhibiting, exhibit A, maybe with accompanying text, in an untouchable glass box, we as museum want the visitor to understand the importance and the meaning of this object encoded in it. Now, most average museum goers are able to understand this type of code. Most people cannot read this concept of objects, of symbols and explanatory texts. And aside from this, it is naturally especially difficult to take in any of these encoded infos if you can't see, if you can't see the object, if you can't see the symbol, if you can't read the explanatory text. So the potential we see in people with visual disabilities is that they have a completely opposite, unique viewpoint to your most classic and basic concept of communicating knowledge in a museum. People who can't see really force us to rethink what we're doing all day long. Is this system of visual symbols and texts really the best way to communicate knowledge at all? And I think it's exactly this change of roles that um, has a lot of potential. Now, we heard of, uh, heard a lot of disabilities in museums and generally the why behind all of this, so let's start taking a look at how. We know that we should do something for inclusion at the museum, we know that we haven't gone far with ideas for that in the past, and we know that doing something with people with visual disabilities could bring us a lot further. Now, what we are lacking at the moment is a holistic approach, a kind of a master plan a fundamental change of ideas and concepts to get us out of a classic exhibition making process. So, we need to renew the concepts behind our daily work. Um, I can already tell you our ideas and um, we think that the following four theoretical concepts will help us to create a more inclusive access to the knowledge we store. I will try to make this short. Um, just one question is the concept of constructivism known to everyone in the room? Or let's ask another way around, who knows the concept of constructivism? That's about half of the people in the room. I'm gonna talk about it hopefully quite quick. Um, this is actually the most important concept for me and I was very happy about our last discussion yesterday evening because we already went into that direction. Um, very basically, a constructivist conceptualization of learning and knowledge means that we quit thinking of learning um, as, as a strictly definable and existing body of knowledge which is transferred in one direction from us to the visitor or the pupil. So um, the idea is basically that we provide access to the objects, the facts and whatever else we research on to your audience. The visitors are allowed to interact with these and within their minds, and now comes, comes the complicated part, they construct their own knowledge. That is something that we cannot generalize for everybody because it is based on their existing knowledge, their previous experiences and general constitution of the day. So these processes are already learning. The measurable success of this process is, generally speaking, a change of mind or behavior. So naturally this means the question if this process was successful gets a lot more difficult. But it also means that we suddenly are much closer to reality and we are suddenly aware that learning can be much more than being able to repeat a certain fact. This again 
enables us to create a value of knowledge transfer that respects different and more versatile ways of learning. I'm going to skip multidirectional communication. You can ask me about it later, but I think we're running out of time. Um, the social expansionary model is quite interesting because this changes the conceptualization we have of um, disability. Just very quickly, if you have uh, knowledge of the concept of gender, this is very close to that. So it's basically society imposing disability on people who don't fit certain categories. Um, the last point is important. Science education is experience basically things that um, if we leave our fixed ideas about knowledge, learning, and disability, we are able to accept other methods of working with archaeological content. So what we want to do is offer visitors and pupils an experience which lifts them out of their daily lives and gives them the opportunity to deal with all archaeological content in their own way. Because these are experiences that are worth remembering and they will be remembered for a long time. So uh, we just need a few adaptions to your theoretical tool set and this is where the gaming comes in. So based on the ideas I've just presented, the next step is to search for the right medium to realize these ideas and gaming games are actually perfectly fit for that. So we already heard about yesterday from Kimberly Himmel that they are perfect learning environment. Um, games can adapt to the player's individual motivation, the skill, the speed, the abilities, the wishes and needs. They allow the player to choose um, his or her own his or her own way of learning and usually they do not force you to learn a certain set of facts without any content context they are fun they are immersive and they take you out of your daily life into the game so uh, the next question might be so why would visually impaired people play games at all they already do gaming industry has understood that being blind doesn't keep you from gaming and there are a few very good examples I can only invite you to try out already on the market I would part these in two groups. Um, they are games that are simply easy to play with something called a screen reader software. I don't know if any of you knows that already. That's basically a software on your Android or Apple phone that reads out everything on the screen to you. So the buttons must be labeled very well, but if that's done, games like Lifeline, which is a text adventure, are very easy to play for blind people. Or there are even games that are only based on audio info, which work very good with um, horror content, but unfortunately, very difficult to play if you're walking around in a museum because you have earphones on your head, you don't hear anything else, and you really have to concentrate where the monster is actually in the room, which you can't see. So uh, just to show you, there are already playable games on the market for people with visual disabilities. Now, museums have already tried to uh, create something um, of... Um, offers people with visual disabilities. This is an example from Berlin, Berlinische Galerie. I can only invite you to go there and try it out. That's basically an app that um, is an audio tour that leads you around the museum based on a beacon system. In addition to that, they have a floor guidance system, they have tactile exhibits, really nice ones, and tactile floor plans. So this can be an inspiration for projects like that. We are trying to go a bit further we talked with our local um, clubs for, visual with, um, for people with visual disabilities about our idea of games. And they in turn told us what is important for them when they visit a museum. And that was a easy, secure orientation during the whole museum visit, high quality info, and an easy, not completely new system. So our idea is we want to create a screen reader friendly text adventure app game because these are easy to play for people with visual disabilities similar to the crisis line games, which in combination with either beacons, near field communication or QR codes, we can talk about that later, leads you through the permanent exhibition of the Neanderthal Museum. Now, um, since blind smartphone users already use the smartphones for all way of help, orientation, identifying things and so on, this is not a completely new technology for them. The high quality information is provided by the game content and some more gadgets I'm going to show in a second. And the secure orientation is provided by both the digital orientation the app and a tactile floor guidance system. So this is a um, visualization we have from a graphic studio in Berlin. This is a view into our permanent exhibition. The idea is that you have a tactile guidance system guiding you to several stations in the museum, which can look like the picture on the left hand side. There you will find tactile objects. And the app will ask you to interact with these objects 
by examining them, for example, to find certain details to help you continue playing the game. And the idea behind that is that you actually have to go to the museum and interact with the objects and not just simply play the game at home on your sofa. So how are we going to do that? Uh, with a whole lot of evaluation. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a logo of BSVN up there. This is the largest regional, regional club for people with visual disabilities in our region. They are our project partner. We're going to work through the game concept, the materials we use, the technology we use, all through that with them, together with them. And the idea is in the next two to three years to create at least four game prototypes, evaluate this with our colleagues from BSVN, and um, yeah, in that way create something that is really inclusive, really playable, and also, hopefully, really fun. Project starts next January 2019. The first playable prototype is planned for, well, let's say the second half of 2019. So I can invite you to come over and play by then. That's the end of my presentation. I'm hope, I hope that you know, we're all still awake and ready for discussion. And I'm really happy if you can give me any ideas or inspiration maybe for the gameplay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for this amazing subject. Um, are there any questions? There are. So don't be hesitant. You can raise your hands earlier on. Where is the cube? The microphone's all the way. Is this going to work? This is going to work. Come on, get ready. Yay. Whoa, that just went fine. OK, um, yeah, I was wondering about the tactile objects you showed. Are these uh, uh, authentic original objects or are they 3D prints? It's a mixture. Um, we're going to use, we're not going to use 3D prints because we have loads of school glasses in a museum um, and they ruin everything. <laughs> So 3D prints by now are unfortunately not stable enough for that. But they are special companies, um, especially in France for some reason, who produce um, reproductions in a very stable, high quality level. And we're going to use some of these. We're going to combine that with some original archaeological tools, which mm -hmm. are real tools then. And uh, we're also going to um, reproduce some of the um, reconstruction, the um, human e reconstructions of Neanderthals we have in a museum, so that the people are able to touch the heads, to touch the face, to get a, yeah, a visual picture of what Neanderthals could look like. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was wondering, because uh, some time ago I read an article on another museum or a research project, and I think they were printing uh, paintings even, yeah. so for blind people, so they could touch the structure of it. Yeah. So yeah, it is possible, I guess. This so. is a really great way, but the problem is that if you want to survive that, if you want that stuff to survive in an exhibition that is used each day, yeah. It simply needs to be made of another material. Yeah. So it is perfect if you want to show um, a restricted group of people certain objects. And we're certainly going to use that in a special series of workshops we are currently making for people with disabilities. But we cannot you know, put these things in the permanent exhibition. Yeah, or you have to make very expensive prints expensive materials. There, yeah. there are materials that are very resilient, but they're yeah, yeah. very expensive. Yeah. OK, thanks. And I thought, yeah, exactly. Hey, great project and a really good presentation. I really liked it. Um, I was wondering, um, if you talk about inclusivity, um, do you mean that people with official disabilities work together with people who do not have them or are not diagnosed as such? Because I think then your game could also add another layer for people that are not visually impaired to experience a museum in the way that people with visual uh, disabilities. Thank you for the question. This is exactly the idea we have. So we're not trying to produce a game which you hand over to people with disabilities when you come to a museum like, oh, you are visually impaired. There you go. And now mm -hmm. go off in your separate corner. This is not the idea. The idea is to produce something with people who are visually impaired for everyone, because this is simply a new way of experiencing a museum, which could be interesting for any visitor coming to the museum, which could be interesting for anyone who has a problem with our usual symbolic encoded system of exhibiting things. So yeah, it's for everyone. It's not only <laughs> for people with visual disabilities. Um, we unfortunately have to go on for the next presentation. We need to keep a schedule here. 
So thank you very much for this presentation.